This is Off-Road Independence, episode number 28. This podcast is brought to you by BeginnersFab.com, the site that teaches you how to make useful, interesting, and creative things with basic tools. Think you don't have the fabrication tools necessary to make what you need? Think again. BeginnersFab.com. This is Off-Road Independence, the podcast that talks about trail repair, vehicle modification, and gear selection, helping you become more independent in your off-road adventures. Hey everybody and welcome back to Off-Road Independence. My name is Eric McGrew. Uh, You'll probably see around me that my ambience is not the typical ambience. Um, Unfortunately, my voice quality is not the same as normal either because I don't have my mic. Um, I'm in, you know, I'm in refuge I guess is the is the thing. Um, The volcano behind my house, literally behind my house like, I don't know, nine miles I guess from the crater uh, erupted. And so now I am staying at some friends' houses about 60 miles from my house. And today I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to talk to Dan Cole of the 4x4 podcast. Um, we've not spoken too much in actual person, but we, we chat online a little bit and we listen to each other's podcasts, which are cool as well. So, um, But Dan has a really cool project he's doing right now. And this is really going to be kind of, um, well, it's for all off-roaders, but it's really something that I thought was tangible for like beginner off-roaders uh, or beginner fabricators, sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm going to actually let Dan explain to us a little bit about what his project is that we're talking about today. Yeah, so thanks for having me on first off. I'm, I'm always excited to, uh, to talk about the trailer project that I'm building and especially, you know, if I've got the garage door open, the neighbors are always coming by and asking, hey, what are you doing? What are you building? Them? And they've kind of seen it go from, uh, I don't even think they realize what it started out as. But yeah. I, I'm building an expedition-style trailer to support my family of five and a dog uh, from Kansas City all the way up to Fairbanks, Alaska. And we're going to hit uh, Yellowstone, um, the Craters of the Moon uh, National Park in Idaho, go over to the uh, Pacific Coast Highway and go from New uh, Portland up to to Seattle and over to the Northwest Overland Rally and Workshop uh, before we actually head up the uh, through British Columbia, the Yukon Territory, and then hit the Alaska Highway into Fairbanks. Um, and the point of this project was to just kind of show what can be done with uh, just a little bit of skill and fabrication. And from a beginner standpoint because like most off-roaders I I would love to just go drop, you know, 30 or 40,000 dollars on one of those awesome uh camper trailers that are made in Australia for overlanding trips, but yeah. I don't have that kind of money. It's hard and, to find that kind of cash. Yeah, especially on something you know you're just going to beat up and abuse. Yeah. Um and so a long time ago, I guess it was about 3 years ago, I interviewed uh, Scott Cheney from Compact Camping Concepts. Mhm. On uh, for the 4x4 podcast and he has a lot of experience building these smaller lightweight type of trailers um, and he's got some great engineering background and has developed a, a tried and true method of building these wooden boxes to sit on top of a lightweight frame um, and he's got a couple different options that he recommends uh, one is you know having a fully boxed trailer frame fabricated mm-hmm. um, but that can get pretty expensive pretty quick depending on you know the the cost of steel at the time and if you're having somebody else weld it up then it can get really expensive Uh, the other option is the one that i've taken is using a harbor freight frame and harbor freight is you know widely known as being a cheap chinese chinese made uh trailer Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think it's it's a really good starting point as long as you understand that it, it has some limitations and take that into consideration as you fabricate a trailer for it yeah. um so i went ahead and used the the largest heaviest duty frame they have which was i think rated for like two thousand pounds mm-hmm. and i'm keeping it it's a full four four foot by eight foot size 
and I've I went down to the metal supply and got a two inch by two inch square tubing and bolted that the entire length of the frame from the tongue all the way to the very back of the trailer. Okay. And it, it fits perfect right in line with the tongue of the trailer mm. down each of the uh, ladder crossbars on the mm-hmm. frame to the very back. And when I assembled everything, I used grade eight hardware with uh, the red Loctite. Mm-hmm. So that's just about as good as welding as you can get without actually welding. Yeah, so on the frame itself, um, that 2x2 two two that you put from the tongue all the way back, how did you mount that to those cross members? So I ran a grade 8 bolt straight through the trailer frame all the way through the square tubing. Okay. And capped it off at the bottom. Okay, so you didn't so. make like a bracket around the... Um, Two by two, you actually drilled through the two by two and bolted it to the center of the cross frame. Correct. Okay, yeah. I got you. I was just curious. And so all the bolted because if everybody, um, if you haven't seen these trailers from Harbor Freight, they come in flat pack, right? They're, they're you just it bolt did. them together. And did you reinforce it in any way where they bolt together, or did you just leave it as they have it and put the red Loctite on there? I, I left it as they had it, and when I'm the the point I'm trying to to do is keep it lightweight so that mm-hmm. way it's not putting more torque uh, on it than absolutely necessary. So the box that's going on top is actually half inch uh, plywood. I'm adding an additional, or I already have added a three quarter inch sheet of plywood that will remain permanently mounted on the frame, and it's bolted on in I think 16 different places. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's lightweight enough, but it has enough structure to it that it'll keep it from twisting or anything too much um i've also replaced the the slipper springs that come with those trailers are pretty crappy they're noisy they're stiff they're just not real good so i've replaced the bracket um and the springs with a kit that uh scott cheney and makes for and he sells them on the website at compactcampingconcepts.com if anybody wants to go and try and pick those up and so it's rated Oh, and I replaced the axle with a 3,500-pound axle. Okay. Where did you get the axle from? From him as well, or did you get that from somebody uh, else? He does sell them, but you know, an axle is pretty heavy to try and order through the mail. Mm-hmm. So I just went down to a trailer supply or a trailer store near me. It's a half-hour drive and had it custom-made. So it is designed to fit the width of the trailer, accounting for the, uh, the wheels that I had. So the wheels that are going on the trailer actually match the bolt pattern and size of the Yukon XL that I'm going to be pulling the trailer with. Mm -hmm. So that way I don't have to take as many spare tires on this long trip. I can still use the spare from the truck on the trailer or if the trailer, you know, if I use up my spares, (laughs) I can pull a wheel off the trailer, and leave it on the side, go get a tire and then come back for the trailer. Mm -hmm. I've got some flexibility there. Yeah. That's a good idea. I've I've actually looked at doing the same for my stuff, but um, it's fairly expensive to build axles here because the hubs are so expensive at the junkyards. And right. I have the um, Chevy six lug pattern for like the Trooper, which was the Isuzu Trooper, or like a a Chevy. Yeah. Um, I think it's six by five and point five or something like that. Yep. And um, here, an axle, just the axle with the two hubs, will cost me around three hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah, it's fairly expensive, so I haven't gotten to yeah. the trailer building stage yet. Yeah, I picked up the axle and the both hubs already mounted and everything and the spring perches welded on at the right spot. I think it was it was right around two hundred bucks. Oh yeah, no. But bad. then I so then I went and picked up two wheels from a, a salvage yard. Mm-hmm. I think it was fifty bucks per wheel. And they were just takeoffs from something else so yeah. i made sure they matched the same design cleaned them up and gave them a coat of paint and some clear coat so they look nice and uh that was it for them you know i still had to get the wheels or the tires anyways mm-hmm. um but i upgraded the tires on the yukon and two of those tires were still in great shape so i just had them mounted on for the trailer so now all the tires match the same size the wheel bolt pattern matches and it's good to go Great. So the next project was tackling the box, and mm-hmm. uh, I spent many, probably a, many hours just staring at this bare frame in the garage, and I've scribbled it out on paper, I've 
I, I eventually got to the point where I had it all dumped into uh, to SketchUp. Mm-hmm. Have you ever used SketchUp for the yeah for some cat design? I've used SketchUp a little bit. I have a hard time getting everything to meet flush without overlapping and cutting it off. I, I'm not yeah. real good at that 3D CAD stuff, honestly. So uh, I use yeah. Illustrator more than anything. Okay, yeah, that's probably better, anyways. But I, I just looked up some uh, tutorials on mm-hmm. YouTube on how to use SketchUp and ended up coming out with a really cool 3D rendering of the whole trailer. Yeah. Now, so I'm pretty happy with that. But before you get into the box that you built. I, I yeah. want to ask real quick, what is it that you were kind of like, what were the absolute necessities that you wanted the trailer to be able to accommodate as far as equipment, as far as um, utilities, that kind of stuff? So I grew up backpacking, and mm-hmm. so I'm used to not having many creature comforts, uh, but I have a wife and two girls and then a baby. So I got to make sure they're all taken care of and comfortable for a, a long duration trip like this. So the essentials was uh, water that would supply a hot shower. Mm-hmm. Um, needed to have some power to charge up you know, devices and things like that without running down the primary battery on the Yukon. Um, also need to have some spare fuel for the trip because there's some, some long stages of the trip where I need to have some, some fuel to refill the, the fuel tank. Mm-hmm. Um, and just room to spread out. I've come to find out that it, the more stuff that you have piled inside the vehicle is just, it's going to make it uncomfortable. So the more I can move to the trailer and keep the vehicle relatively empty, it, the better. And also this last uh, major trip that we did, we had a vehicle broken into. Mm. So I want to have everything kind of out of sight and out of mind and locked up in the trailer if I can. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so... And that's those were kind of the core design things that I had to have. Um, so the first thing I had to d- figure out was, you know, water is probably going to be the heaviest thing that I take. So I've I've got a 25 gallon water tank that sits directly above the axle, so that way it keeps the weight pretty well balanced, and that's not going to put too much stress on the frame since it's it's a long tube or, or a long tank. Uh, so it's it's not just trying to put torque all on one spot. Uh, then I've got a three gallon per minute, uh, 12 volt pump, mm-hmm. which will supply water pressure to the, uh, Triton camp shower. And that's a pretty cool little unit. I think it was like 127 bucks. And it has, I think four D cell batteries to operate the starter, the igniter and it's propane powered. So as soon as it senses water flowing through the unit, it ignites the, the tankless heater Mm-hmm. and heats the water as it circulates through the through the tubes, I guess. Yeah. And so within about five seconds, you've got hot water flowing, mm-hmm. which is pretty awesome. Yeah, me and Dan, for everybody listening, it's kind of funny because Dan has lived in um, Korea, he was telling me, right? And I yeah. live in Chile. And what me and Dan see everybody trying to use on their Expedition trailers for hot water is like, what we, what I still have to use to this day for hot water in the house, uh, hot water yeah. heaters do not exist here. They do, but nobody can afford them, and nobody can afford the natural gas to use them. So these right. tankless well, hot it, water heaters work. It makes a whole lot more sense because you're not, you know, boiling a giant tank of water and then letting it sit there. Because yeah. most of the time, you're not running hot water. So why would you spend money on trying to to keep it hot and uh, let all that heat, you know, leach out through a tank? Yeah, I understand so. they're fairly popular in Europe, too, in a lot of places because of space constraints inside the small yeah. uh, apartments and stuff. They're a really good system. You have to keep them clean, just giving yep. a little detail for other people uh, that haven't used them. You do want to keep the carbon buildup and that kind of stuff clean, the burners and that kind of stuff. But yeah. honestly, they're, they're a good system to use. So if you're looking at a trailer like Dan's looking at, then it might be something you want to look into as well. To it, It's better than having a black piece of PVC pipe on top of your your truck and hoping it gets warm enough that you can take a shower in it you know yeah well even those are still gravity feeds so you'd have to have it up and you get pretty low pressure whereas this uh three gallon per minute pump is going to get plenty of pressure to to supply some hot water through a shower and it comes with a shower head on the the triton unit yeah so that's a great solution yeah now can i ask about how much you had planned for to spend on the trailer as a as like a budget limit 
So I had a 16-foot car hauler trailer, mm -hmm. and I sold that for $1,300, uh, which was, I think, $7 more than I paid for it eight years ago. <laughs> Not a bad investment. Yeah, so that worked out great, and that usually hauled my Jeep around. Um, but I, since the government is paying to move the vehicle for me to Alaska, I don't need the trailer. Yeah. So I use that as a starting point, and I kind of budgeted for eighteen to two thousand dollars for the whole trailer. And I think I may have gone over that a little bit. I got to go back and look at my spreadsheet, uh, but I only went over it because I added in all these additional creature comforts like the dual battery system that I'm doing. Yeah. It runs kind of an umbilical cord from the the battery on the Yukon to the trailer to charge it while it's driving. And then I can push a button and link them together and actually use the trailer battery to start the Yukon if I needed to. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so that that house battery is going to be there to supply power to some lights inside the trailer. I've got some floodlights they're going to go on the outside of the trailer so I don't have to, you know, run a bunch of lanterns around camp mm -hmm. and worry about the kids getting burned on that. Uh, let's see, what else is going to supply? Oh, also power to the, the pump for the water pump and just uh, various other things. Mm -hmm. So we've got that kind of took up some money. The shower, you know, that took up some money. But the frame in, in the box alone would have had me in right around 1300 bucks. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's not I mean in comparison to like we were talking about even some of the cheaper super basic off-road trailers are like right. you know 6 7 8 grand for something that's like super basic just a shell. Yeah. And they have, you know, bigger fender flares for the bigger tires or whatnot, but I mean you've got yep. a full trailer going on here and you're at even a quarter of what they're charging for those kind of things. So that's not too bad. Yeah. No, no, that's not accounting for any – if I were to add in the cost of my own labor, yeah. that would probably jack the price up. But the, you know, the point is that I'm doing it myself. It's mm -hmm. a project that once it's done, I can say, hey, me and my family built this, mm -hmm. and it supported us on our adventures around the United States and uh, through Canada. Well, I guess you can just say North America now. Yeah. So quick so. question before I forget so that everybody kind of has an idea. With the box you're putting on the trailer – you said you're using plywood and stuff like that. How are you actually fastening that? Are you just drilling through the sides of the plywood into the sides of the plywood? Or are you using um, like L brackets? or? So that was one of the things that I went back and forth on a lot of different methods. I'm real – I've used a lot of the pocket screw, like mm -hmm. the Craig, Craig screw jigs. Um, but after talking to Scott Chaney, he recommended using what he calls the uh, corner block method. And it basically takes a one-by-one one piece of wood and goes around the corners of the entire box. And then you screw in from the plywood into that one-by-one one, uh, block. Tightening it to the outside of the plywood instead of screwing through the block outward to the plywood. Right? Correct. Yeah. Because that way, coming from the outside in, you're catching every layer of the plywood and pulling it into the, I guess, the skeleton of it. Yeah. Okay. And so I went ahead and did that. And, of course, using a lot of... Uh, a lot of wood glue, mm -hmm. and I, I've gone with the Type Bond Three wood glue because that is by far the very best um, for exterior type projects. It's not water resistant; it is waterproof. Okay, good. Uh, and it seeps into the wood really well, and just it's a really, really great glue. So I, I totaled it up yesterday after I finished screwing the top in. I've used uh, I think close to seven pounds of screws. Mm -hmm. and three quarts of of wood glue. Okay, wow. Which, That's which is a, a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> how, are, um, how are you waterproofing the, the trailer itself, or how waterproof is it? Because you've got to have some compartments that open and stuff like that, right? Yep, I've got uh, basically three compartments. There's a front section where I'm going to have the 12-volt fridge, um, and the, the trash compartment and everything for the, the portable toilet that we have. The next compartment is for the chuck box with our full mm -hmm. kitchen, the Dutch ovens, the camp shower, and the propane tank. And then the, the rear compartment is all just cargo storage for our duffel bags, camp chairs. And I actually have a table. This is one of the slick design things that I have is when you open up that back door, there is a frame that kind of hangs down from the roof 
mm-hmm. and actually the table will slide in there. So uh, even with all the duffel bags and everything piled inside the back, you can still easily slide out that table, set up, have dinner or lunch, whatever, slide it back in and get back on the road without having to unpack everything. Very cool. Yeah. And what are you sealing the box on the outside with? Um, like just a latex paint, an oil paint? Uh, what kind of seal and coating are you giving to that wood so it doesn't get weathered? Well, I was looking at using Monster Liner, mm-hmm. like a bed liner coating. Um, and Scott Chaney's had lots of great success with some stuff called Durabac. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially a, it's a one-part bed liner type system. Um, but that gets pretty expensive. When I looked at the box, I've got to have... I'm covering 208 square feet of wood. Yeah, that's a lot. And if you figure your average truck bed is about 86 square feet, you can take that price for coating a bed uh, three times. <laughs> yeah. So that got expensive real fast. And so I've looked at a lot of different things, and I was ready to drop the couple hundred bucks for the, uh, for the bed liner, for the Durabox stuff. Uh, but then I discovered something that was made for decks, Mm -hmm. uh, stuff that's going to be exposed to lots of foot traffic, shoes, and being out in the sunshine all the time. Tough coat? Uh, No, I think it's made by Rust-Oleum, but it's like a times 10 stuff. And so it's still going to have that rough kind of bed liner Mm -hmm. finish, but the finish is close to a quarter inch thick because it goes on really thick and heavy. Okay. I asked about so tough coat. Oh, sorry. I asked about tough coat because I um, I had thought about importing tough coat to Chile and selling it, but because of chemical restrictions and that kind of stuff, and it's made for that. It's made for the insides yeah. of swimming pools and swimming deck areas. They use okay. it in a lot of like theme parks for that kind of stuff, um, and it looks like a really good product too. And it's water based, so you don't have to use any kind of xylene. You don't have to use anything to clean it up with, and that's why I thought there you go. Cabela's sells it. I think for boats. You know what? I've seen it there. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But this was this was something else. I'd have to go back and look at it. But I think it's made by Rust Oleum. Okay. Uh, but it comes in five gallon buckets. Mm-hmm. I bought two buckets, which will give me a little more than I need. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll apply some extra coats to the bottom of the trailer and to that front side, uh, the areas that are going to get pounded by gravel the most. Yeah. To give them some additional protection. Okay. Um. And and when well, it. Sorry. When it's all said and done, the box is actually going to be removable. So I can jack the box up, slide some sawhorses under it or something, and pull the trailer out. So I'll still have the trailer as a utility-type trailer to go pick up firewood or whatever I need to. Yeah, good idea. Now, the box and everything is mostly storage in the kitchen and that kind of stuff, right? So what kind of camping are you planning on doing? Are you going to put like a rooftop tent on it? Or are you going to have it a platform so you set up a normal tent on top of the trailer or camp off the trailer so what i'm going to be doing is actually putting a bike rack uh for this leg of the trip on the on the trailer Mm -hmm. um so that way you know we've all got the kids and my and we've got a trailer for the baby um and that's how i'll go up to alaska but eventually i i'm going to move the rooftop tent that we're buying to the trailer so that way it's a self-contained uh, camping system that I can mm-hmm. pull with my Jeep. Uh, but we are using a uh, Tipui uh, rooftop tent. We're getting the Grand Sabana, which is their big daddy, biggest one they make. Um, and that'll sleep all of us. And it's got the little drop down annex. Uh, mm-hmm. So if we have some guests that want to go camping with us or meet up on the road, and uh, or if we just want to, you know, set up the kitchen underneath the tent to get out of the rain because I'm sure it's going to rain on us somewhere in the Pacific Northwest or up in Alaska or the Yukon. Probably so. Or, you know, just to get away from the bugs. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that. Where I, I don't have it yet, uh, but that's in the budget to order here very soon. And we'll hopefully here in a month have the whole trailer wrapped up and ready for a shakedown trip. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the photos. Um, if, if any of you guys are interested who are listening, you can go over to Dan Cole's site. Um, look him up, Dan Cole, on Facebook. He's got yep. some photos up on there. Do you have photos anywhere else of the trailer build, or is it all on Facebook? No, yeah, I've been putting a lot of them on Instagram, since okay. Instagram is real oh, yeah. photo-heavy, uh, and there's a lot of interaction there. And I think I may have actually put more there than on the, uh, the 4x4 podcast page. Um, but we're also, we've kind of launched a new site, a uh, new podcast altogether, the Overland Roundtable. 
oh, that that's caters right. specifically to overlanding um, instead of you know jamming up the four by four podcast with all of one topic. Uh, that's more of a general off roading show. So uh, kind of spread out the content there, mm-hmm. but. I think Instagram is probably the best place to find uh, all those pictures. And you can f- just look it up, uh, the 4 by 4 podcast on Instagram. Yeah. And, and you'll find all kinds of great stuff. Yeah, and I'm not part of it yet, and I'm not saying I won't be part of it, but pretty soon I'm, I'm looking into the option because um, Dan here is also connected with the XJ talk show. And um, what is the one about Land Rovers? Uh, isn't that right, the new one? Yeah, the Center Steer podcast the Center is Steer. all about everything Land Rovers. And you guys are all part of what is the off-road network? Is the four by four radio network? The four by four radio network. So I'm I'm looking into. I've just been really busy um, with everything, so I I haven't really gotten. <laughs> Turns around out to an think exploding about volcano it. takes yeah. up some time. <laughs> yeah, it takes up a bit of your life. So um, I, me not being part of it doesn't mean I'm against it. Uh, and you guys should really check that out too, because if you can't find something through Dan's site or my site, you can go there and find a lot of stuff that you might want to find out for off-roading and um i've been watching dan's build uh, i'm glad you reminded me of instagram because that's where i actually see most of the photos and i don't yeah. think about it and um you can see a lot there he's got going on I-, I really like the trailer i love how simple it is man it's just that's what i like about it. no welding you know really yep. so far you've been doing everything bolt on and everything and i've been really stoked to see how this works out for you so that people who do want to do something that's cool that's functional but super basic can see right. i don't have to buy a welder i don't have to you know invest all this cash in it so and yeah I, and that's not to say i won't in the future transition to using a fully boxed and welded yeah. frame um but you know like you said it's just to highlight what can be done if you uh put your mind to it and uh take your time in the process of building it yeah no and i appreciate it um if this podcast sounds a little rushed, I apologize, folks. It kind of is a little rushed, um, <laughs> but in a good sense. We we wanted to get together. We had a little bit of spare time. We want to talk about it, and um, my my schedule once again not not making excuses, but the reality is my schedule is kind of crazy, being the way it is. So, Dan, really, thanks for coming on the show for a few minutes with me to talk about your very cool project. I'm yeah, really, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to seeing the photos and seeing how it works out up there and uh, your trip north, you know, to to Alaska. I'm curious as to how it'll handle on the road too. Um, me too. <laughs> you know, one one tip, and you may know this. Okay, so just one tip. I used to drive pest control trucks because I did pest control, and we had the like 50 gallon tanks in the back. You know, uh-huh. when that tank gets halfway full, oh yeah, be very careful because that water shifts. And yep. I've slid through more than one red light because <laughs> it turned yellow and red and it was a slightly wet day and that water pushed forward and there you go. You know, so just yep. be very careful with that. Oh, that's a good question. What what braking system are you going to use with it real quick? Are you using I'm inertia actually brakes? Not, or? I'm, I'm not using a brake system on this trailer okay. at all because, like I said, I'm pulling it with the Yukon XL, which yeah. is rated to tow 10,000 pounds. And the loaded weight of this trailer, I've calculated to be about 2,000. Okay, cool. So it's, it's well within the limits, and the brake system on that Yukon is excellent. It should be able to stop it, no problem. Okay, perfect. Well, now we'll close out. So, so once again, <laughs> thanks, Dan, for, for coming on. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Um, when do you guys make your trip? Uh, Mid-June. We're actually pulling out Mid-June. of town here. Yeah, so, not too long. Yeah, and I need to get it wrapped up here so we can do a, a test trip and make sure I've got all the kinks worked out and everything's buttoned up. Yeah. Now, there's probably going to be some projects that are not complete. I'll have to finish them during pauses along the journey, uh, <laughs> but it'll at least be complete enough that we can get the primary stuff going. The axle's mounted, the light's yep. working, and the trailer hitch mounted, and that's your biggest – well, the box, too. You don't want it to yeah, fall off. Yeah, right I've got to get the box – final mounted i've i've put it together and it's not in its final mounting because i do have to pay, take it off and do all the painting on the bottom side still yeah. but uh, well and it's it's coming soon dan just recently showed how important it is to have at least one high lift jack around it um he used well two, yeah in fact. i had to call a buddy because that was funny the trailer when i put it on jack stands was as i took off the little tiny 12 inch wheels and to put on the 33 inch tires on here 
Uh, I had to lift it up a lot. And I probably could have lifted it up. You know, it was just a deadlift of probably about 500 pounds. So it would have been a strain, uh, but I probably could have done it and had somebody slide jack stands under it. But instead, I called up a buddy, borrowed his high lift, and we uh, lifted it up. It was still pretty unsteady, um, yeah. but you just take your time and you got it. Yeah, trailers are never fun to lift, no matter how you do it. It's it's always yeah. awkward. So, But once again, yeah. very, very cool. Thanks, Dan, for being on the show. And don't forget, guys, go by the 4x4 podcast and also the 4x4 Off-Road Network. 4x4 Radio Network. Radio it's Network. just 4x4radio.com, I think, is our website. And you okay. can just hit play there, and it'll cycle through hours and hours and hours of off-roading content while you're at work. I'm going to get hate mails from Tony and Josh by not being <laughs> able to remember this. <laughs> That's okay. They butcher it. They can't even remember it on their own show. <laughs> so, but, but everybody listening, um, take, take Dan as an example. He's done a lot with a relatively small amount of cash. Um, some time invested, yeah, but it it's not about TIG welding and, and MIG welding all the time. Sometimes it's just about having something reasonable that's strong, well-designed, and that is practical, you know? Um, yeah. I think we get over, sometimes we get overly focused on that beauty factor of being like a boutique kind of yeah. piece made, and it's not always needed. I mean, th if you can afford that, that's fine, but really, it's not always needed, yeah. so... Well, manage your expectations and have a little appetite suppress it when it comes to uh, what you want to accomplish. Yeah. And you can really do a lot. And that's really why I'm doing it is to inspire people to take what they have, their resources available, and get out and make the most of it. Well, thanks, man. Um, that's, it's, been, it's been good to hear about it. Uh, so we're going to leave it at that, and we'll talk to you later, all right? Sounds great. Talk to you later. Please don't forget to stop by and check out Dan Cole at the 4x4 Podcast and also to check out all of my sites over at ericmagrew.tv and beginnersfab.com as well as offroadindependence.com.